Hi everyone, this is Studio Slave on behalf of ADSR and in this video we're going to be taking a look at the brand new audio device in Ableton Live 10, the drum bus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a drum bus on two of the tracks. I'm going to use a kick track which I've got here which is a single drum and then I have this drum bus which I've just soloed and it's filtered at the moment but it's going to come in very shortly for the chorus. And as you can see I've also put on some metering plugins so we've got Voxango Span and we also have an oscilloscope. And we'll start off by showing you on the main drum bus as that's its main purpose and then we'll move on to the kick on its own. So the drum bus is a analog style drum processor and what it's designed to do is you put it on your drum bus and what it's going to do is it's going to glue all of the sounds or all the drums on that drum bus together and then you can process that either by adding some transients, adding body or maybe just instilling the same character across all of the drums within that group. So it's brilliant for gluing up a mix and making it sound a lot tighter. So it's got quite a lot of tools and none of these tools are new to Ableton Live but what it is doing is bringing them all into one single place. So we've got processes such as compression, distortion, low frequency enhancement, transient shaping and we've also got the ability to dampen high frequencies as well. So firstly we have the trim control here and it seems a bit odd to me that they've put the input area here, I think it should be at the top and you should work your way down but they've decided to put it here. So we have the trim control and this is before any processing is applied. And this will come in handy when we start to add further processing and we start to clip or limit our signal. So we have the trim control and this moves into a compressor. And this compressor is at a fixed value so we can see straight away. This is when we're going to want to start to pull our signal down a bit. And we could also do this with the output gain here, but we want to trim it at this stage because we've got further processing to do. So just so you can hear, off, and you can hear there's quite a lot of makeup gain on this compressor. So as for settings, like I said, it's fixed, so you can't change them, but it's got a fast attack, a average release, and moderate ratio values, so it's designed to glue disparate drum sounds together. So moving into the next stage, we then go and we have the drive, which feeds into these free distortion types. Okay, so these distortion types do work without the drive, so I'll just take the compressor off, put this back up. So we have soft, which is wave shaping distortion, medium, which is limiting distortion, and hard, which is clipping distortion with the bass boost. So you can hear it, but it's not super, super obvious at the moment because we're not using the drive. And what this drive knob does is it drives the input to this distortion. So we're just pushing it further into either the wave shaping, limiting or clipping distortion. And then we can compensate with the amount of drive we're adding by reducing the input gain. So we're not going to be absolutely smashing the output. So if we go back to our hard distortion algorithm, which is clipping, you can't actually see it on the spectrum analyzer here because we don't actually have any low end in the signal. But what this is doing is it's giving it a big bass boost. So just to show you this, what we'll do is we will go across now to the kick drum and you'll be able to see that on the spectrum analyzer when I use that hard distortion and I'll turn it on and off so you can see. And we'll just play this. So we have our soft, our medium and our hard. And we can actually see that here if I take that on and off. So we should be able to hear that bass boost around 50 hertz, which we can see. And what we need to be careful to do here is to make sure we balance the drive and the input trim and the output trim. So we're not overdoing the processing at any one stage. And if we add loads of gain at one place, then we're going to take it away somewhere else. So we're moving our natural loudness bias. So we've now covered most of the input area with the drive, the distortion types, the trim and the compressor. So let's just recap on that signal flow before we move on. We can trim the input gain which is fed into the compressor. The compressor then feeds into this drive and this drive is going to either ramp up the signal or not into one of the free wave shapers or distortion buttons. And then from here it goes into the high mid crunch and damping area. So I think it's a slightly unusual layout, but if you want to know the routing, then that is it. This is where the signal now splits between mid highs and bass, so we'll focus on the mid highs first. The crunch knob is going to add some sine shape distortion to the mid high frequencies, so this is really good for adding some extra snap or crack to our claps and snares.
and if that gets a little bit too much then we can damp that down using the damping and this is essentially just a low pass filter so say if we do have a real gnarly setting and we're getting a bit too much going on in the top end and it's hurting our ears then we can just dampen that down a little bit those higher frequencies just so they're a little bit less piercing on the ear Once we've done this, we then go into the transient section. And this section I really like. Let me just sort this out a little bit. And I'm a big fan of this transient section because whatever way you go, you're going to improve the transients. So once again, if I just squash these a bit. Okay, so we've got a fairly squashed signal there. If we go counterclockwise, what we're going to get is we're going to get a much more punchy signal and it's going to be really tight so we're going to have uh, increased attack and it's going to pull down the sustain and release so if you listen so it's almost like the signal is getting gated and if any of you have ever used the beat preservation in beats mode when you're warping then this does a very similar effect nice punchy little sounds and if we go the other way we're still going to get an increased attack but we're also going to get a increased sustain as well. So it's similar to what compression could do for the mix. So just to show you. So I'll just take that back to the central location. And if you listen, we are actually getting quite a lot of attack as well when we go clockwise. So both ways are punchy in a way. But this way is going to give you more room sounds and more of the actual space and the sustain, whereas this way is going to give you a tighter, punchy, more clear sound. Once we've gone through all of those sections, that's everything for the mid-high, we then go on to the boom. And for this particular sound, like I said, we don't have a lot of boom going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump back over to our kick. And the boom section, what we have is we have the boom dial. And we can see that as we increase this. As we increase this, we're getting more bass here. And this is showing us how much bass we have in our entire so the boom and the input bass as well. So if I turn that all the way down, you can see we've still got a lot of bass in this sound anyway. That's because it's a sample that was already in pretty good condition. What we can also do, this boom is just a resonant filter. So what we can do is we can set that filter wherever we want. So I know that about 49 hertz is G. So we've got boom now in G and we can see this is getting absolutely smashed with gain here. And then I can tune that. And what you might also notice is that we have this moving down here and this is telling us the closest MIDI note and it's also got a little plus or minus symbol to say if we're above or below. So we're just below G and I can click on this and if you watch this here, what it's going to do is it's going to lock to G which will be 49 hertz. And if we go above, you can see it tells us that we're above and we can lock back onto that. So that is really handy, say if you don't know what key your music's in or your kick's in, we can just have a look at our spectrum analyzer in about A. So we can turn this back on and we can go 55 hertz, which is A. But if we don't know that, then we can just sweep through and it will tell us a. And at the moment we've got loads of decay on this, so I'll pull this down. And this decay works not only on the boom that we've added, but it also works on the input sound as well, post distortion and post drive. So I'll just show you. What we can do as well is we can solo the boom as well. So if I just press this button, we're now just hearing those lower frequencies, about below 100 hertz. So we can push this decay up and we can tighten it. And then as we add boom, this decay is going to affect the 
added boom signal as well. So we add some boom now. We can see that coming up on the meters. We can see it here. And then all we've got to do is push out the decay and we're going to get that. So we can get real precise using this monitoring. And when we're happy with it, we just take that off. And it's definitely worth looking at this. If you're smashing loads of bass on there, or if you're using headphones and you can't hear it properly, this could be quite a good indicator as to how much you've got. So at the moment, that's way too much. We're getting absolutely dwarfed in sub. And what I want is I want a bit more mid, mid frequency crunch. So just like I'd use this on a drum bus, I can add some of those chest punching frequencies with this crunch. I can soften if I want to some of the very high end and save that for where my high end percussion is going to go. And then I can take a look at the peak and I can decide, well, do I want more body? Or do I want it to be a more clicky and punchy sound? And we can see there just how profound the scope of this attack portion is. So we can see it really digging out and giving us a pronounced attack. And likewise, it's still giving us a pronounced attack if we go the opposite way, but it's a bit more of a sustained sound. So for this, I think we'll go for something like that. And there's a few different ways, and I want to go through different ways we can use this. So just so you can see the difference with and without, and something to be aware of here, is keep an eye on the meters. We are getting quite a large jump in gain here, so gain staging is the word of the day. Make sure you level your inputs and outputs. But some people think that this is maybe a bit too of a harsh effect. So obviously we'd be compensating for the loudness using this. So I suggest using a meter and making sure that if you're adding loads of gain, then you take that back away again. So you can do some decent A-B testing. But also there's nothing wrong with using this in parallel. So rather than using it completely over the drum bus, you could use it at about 50% or less. And you could actually use it at much, much higher value. So just for example... We could go for something absolutely crazy. We'll go for something like that. And then we can just blend this back in. Just at a small percentage, something like 10%. And it's still giving us what we need, but doing it in this parallel configuration means we've also got the completely unprocessed signal coming through as well. And likewise, we've got the main use of this, which is on a drum bus, hence the name. We've then got using it on a solo instrument, and it doesn't have to be a kick. It could be absolutely anything. We can then use it in parallel. And another alternative way to use this would be to make a return track and then use it in a send and return configuration. So what I'll do, rather than putting it on here, is I'll use the keyboard shortcut Command, Alt and T. And that gives us a new return track. We'll just drag the drum bus onto this. Then we can go for whatever settings we want, whether we want them to be harsh or gentle. And then we can send whatever sounds we want from anywhere within our project over to this drum bus. And it's going to give us a sense of glue and pull all of these sounds together and give them the same sonic characteristics. And the beauty of this device doing multiple processes is that you can use this for whatever you want. So it could be a parallel transient enhancer, it could be a parallel compressor. You might just want to use it to colour the whole mix with the same type of saturation. This drum bus can really work whatever you want it to do across the whole mix. So in this video we've covered the drum bus device and all of its functions and features. And as you can see, we can use it as a stereotypical drum bus to glue all of our sounds together, but we can also use it in many different alternative ways, such as in a parallel or send and return configuration. And the key here is just to experiment with it, and I'm sure you'll find that it will work really nicely on a range of different instruments and not just the drums. So give it a go and let us know what you think. Thanks for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one where we're going to be covering the brand new pedal device in Ableton Live 10.